This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nocturna Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure by John Cleland Part 10 Louisa herself did not long outstay this adventure at Mrs. Cole's, to whom, by the by, we took care not to boast of our exploit, till all fear of consequences were clearly over. For an occasion presenting itself of proving her passion for a young fellow, at the expense of her discretion, proceeding all in character, she packed up her toilet at half a day's warning, and went with him abroad, since which I entirely lost sight of her, and it never fell in my way to hear what became of her. But a few days after she had left us, two very pretty young gentlemen, who were Mrs. Cole's especial favorites, and free of her academy, easily obtained her consent for Emily's and my acceptance of a party of pleasure at a little but agreeable house belonging to one of them, situated not far up the River Thames on the Surrey side. Everything being settled, and it being a fine summer day, but rather of the warmest, we set out after dinner and got to our rendezvous about four in the afternoon. We're landing at the foot of a neat, joyous pavilion. Emily and I were handed into it by our squires, and there drank tea with a cheerfulness and gaiety that the beauty of the prospect, the serenity of the weather, and the tender politeness of our sprightly gallants naturally led us into. After tea, and taking a turn in the garden, my particular, who was the master of the house, and had in no sense schemed this party of pleasure for a dry one, proposed to us, with that frankness which his familiarity at Mrs. Cole's entitled him to, as the weather was excessively hot, to bathe together, under a commodious shelter that he had prepared expressly for that purpose, in a creek of the river with which a side door of the pavilion immediately communicated, and where we might be sure of having our diversions out, safe from interruption, and with the utmost privacy. Emily, who never refused anything, and I, who ever delighted in bathing, and had no exception to the person who proposed it, or to those pleasures it was easy to guess it implied, took care, on this occasion, not to wrong our training at Mrs. Cole's, and agreed to it with as good a grace as we could, upon which, without loss of time, we returned instantly to the pavilion, one door of which opened into a tent, pitched before it that with its marquise formed a pleasing defense against the sun or the weather and was besides as private as we could wish the lining of it embossed cloth represented a wild forest foliage from the top down to the sides which in the same stuff were figured with fluted pilasters with their spaces between filled with flower vases the whole having a gay effect upon the eye wherever you turned it. Then it reached sufficiently into the water, yet contained convenient benches round it, either to keep our clothes, or in short, for more uses than resting upon. There was a side table too, loaded with sweetmeats, jellies, and other eatables, and bottles of wine and cordials by way of occasional relief from any rawness or chill of the water, or from any faintness from whatever cause and in fact my gallant who understood cher and tiers perfectly and who for taste even if you would not approve this specimen of it might have been comptroller of pleasures to a roman emperor had left no requisite towards convenience or luxury unprovided as soon as we had looked round this inviting spot and every preliminary of privacy was duly settled strip was the word when the young gentleman soon dispatched the undressing each his partner and reduced us to the naked confession of all those secrets of person which dress generally hides and which the discovery of was naturally speaking not to our disadvantage our hands indeed mechanically carried towards the most interesting part of us screened at first 
all from the tufted cliff downwards, till we took them away at their desire, and employed them in doing them the same office, of helping off with their clothes, in the process of which there passed all the little wantonnesses and frolics that you may easily imagine. As for my spark, he was presently undressed, all to his shirt, the forelappet of which, as he leaned languishingly on me, he smilingly pointed me to observe, as it bellied out or rose and fell, according to the unruly starts of the motion behind it. But it was soon fixed, for now taking off his shirt, and naked as a cupid, he shooed at me at so upright a stand as prepared me indeed for his application to me for instant ease. But though the sight of its fine size was fit enough to fire me, the cooling air as I stood in this state of nature, joined to the desire I had of bathing first, enabled me to put him off and tranquilize him with the remark that a little suspense would only set a keener edge on the pleasure. Leading then the way, and shewing our friends an example of continency, which they were giving signs of losing respect to, we went hand in hand into the stream, till it took us up to our neck, where the no more than grateful coolness of the water gave my senses a delicious refreshment from the sultriness of the season, and made me more alive, more happy in myself, and, in course, more alert, and open to voluptuous impressions. Here I laved and wantoned with the water, or sportively played with my companion, leaving Emily to deal with hers at discretion. Mine, at length, not content with making me take the plunge over head and ears, kept splashing me and provoking me with all the little playful tricks he could devise, and which I strove not to remain in his debt for. We gave, in short, a loose to mirth, and now nothing would serve him but giving his hands the regale of going over every part of me, neck, breast, belly, thighs, and all the etc., so dear to the imagination, under the pretext of washing and rubbing them, as we both stood in the water, no higher now than the pit of our stomachs, and which did not hinder him from feeling, and toying with that leak that distinguishes our sex, and so wonderfully water-tight, for his fingers, in vain dilating and opening it, only let more flame than water into it, be it said without a figure. At the same time, he made me feel his own engine, which was so well wound up as to stand even the working in water, and he accordingly threw one arm round my neck, and was endeavouring to get the better of that harsher construction bred by the surrounding fluid, and had in effect won his way so far as to make me sensible of the pleasing stretch of those nether lips, from the indriving machine, when independent of my not liking that awkward mode of enjoyment, I could not help interrupting him, in order to become joint spectators of a plan of joy, in hot operation between Emily and her partner who, impatient of the fooleries and dalliance of the bath, had led his nymph to one of the benches on the green bank, where he was very cordially proceeding to teach her the difference betwixt jest and earnest. There, setting her on his knee, and gliding one hand over the surface of that smooth, polished, snow-white skin of hers, which now doubly shone with dew-bright luster, and presented to the touch something like one would imagine of animated ivory, especially in those ruby-nippled globes, which the touch is so fond of and delights to make love to. With the other he was lusciously exploring the sweet secret of nature, in order to make room for a stately piece of machinery that stood upreared between her thighs as she continued sitting on his lap, and pressed hard for instant admission, which the tender Emily, in a fit of humor, deliciously protracted, affecting to decline, and elude the very pleasure she sighed for, but in a style of waywardness so prettily put on and managed as to render it ten times more poignant. Then her eyes, all amidst the softest dying languishment, expressed at once a mock denial and extreme desire, whilst her sweetness was zested with a coyness so pleasingly provoking. Her moods of keeping him off were so attractive that they redoubled the impetus rage which he covered her with kisses, 
and the kisses that whilst she seemed to shy from or scuffle for, the cunning wanton contrived such sly returns of, as were doubtless the sweeter for the gust she gave them of being stolen ravished. Thus Emily, who knew no art but that which nature itself, in favor of her principal end, pleasure, had inspired her with, the art of yielding, coyed it indeed, but coyed it to the purpose, for with all her straining, her wrestling, and striving to break from the clasp of his arms, she was so far wiser yet than to mean it, that in her struggles it was visible she aimed at nothing more than multiplying points of touch with him, and drawing yet closer the folds that held them everywhere entwined, like two tendrils of a vine intercurling together, so that the same effect as when Louisa strove in good earnest to disengage from the idiot, was now produced by different motives. Meanwhile, their immersion out of the cold water had caused a general glow, a tender suffusion of heightened carnation over their bodies, both equally white and smooth-skinned, so that as their limbs were thus amorously interwoven, in sweet confusion, it was scarce possible to distinguish who they respectively belonged to, but for the brawnier, bolder muscles of the stronger sex. In a little time, however, the champion was fairly in with her, and had tied at all points the true lover's knot, when now, adieu all the little refinements of a finessed reluctance, adieu the friendly feint. She was presently driven forcibly out of the power of using any art, and indeed, what art must not give way when nature, corresponding with her assailant, invaded in the heart of her capital and carried by storm, lay at the mercy of the proud conqueror who had made his entry triumphantly and completely. Soon, however, to become a tributary, for the engagement growing hotter and hotter at close quarters, she presently brought him to the pass of paying down the dear debt to nature, which had scarce time to plume herself upon her victory, but shot with the same discharge, she in a loud expiring sigh, in the closure of her eyes, the stretch out of her limbs, and a remission of her whole frame, gave manifest signs that all was as it should be. For my part, who had not with the calmest patience stood in the water all this time to view this warm action, I leaned tenderly on my gallant, and at the close of it seemed to ask him with my eyes what he thought of it. But he, more eager to satisfy me by his actions than by words or looks, as we shoaled the water towards the shore, shewed me the staff of love so intensely set up, that had not even charity beginning at home in this case, urged me to our mutual relief. It would have been cruel indeed to have suffered the youth to burst with straining, when the remedy was so obvious and so near at hand. Accordingly, we took to a bench, whilst Emily and her spark, who belonged, it seemed, to the sea, stood at the sideboard, drinking to our good voyage, for, as the last observed, we were well under way, with a fair wind up channel and full freighted, nor indeed were we long before we finished our trip to Cythera and unloaded in the old haven. But as the circumstances did not admit of much variation, I shall spare you the description. At the same time, allow me to place you here an excuse I am conscious of owing you, for having, perhaps, too much affected the figurative style, though surely it can pass nowhere more allowably than in a subject which is so properly the province of poetry, nay, is poetry itself, pregnant with every flower of imagination and loving metaphors, even where not the natural expressions, for respects of fashion and sound, necessarily forbid it. Resuming now my history, you may please to know that what with a competent number of repetitions, all in the same strain, and, by the by, we have a certain natural sense that those repetitions are very much to the taste. What a nice circle of pleasures delicately varied, there was not a moment lost to joy all the time we stayed there, 
till late in the night we were re-escorted home by our squires who delivered us safe to mrs cole with generous thanks for our company this too was emily's last adventure in our way for scarce a week after she was by an accident too trivial to detail you the particulars found out by her parents who were in good circumstances, and who had been punished for their partiality to their son, in the loss of him, occasioned by a circumstance of their overindulgence to his appetite, upon which the so long engrossed stream of fondness, running violently in favor of this lost and inhumanely abandoned child, whom if they had not neglected enquiry about, they might long before have recovered. They were now so overjoyed at the retrieval of her, that, I presume, it made them much less strict in examining the bottom of things, for they seemed very glad to take for granted in the lump everything that the grave and decent Mrs. Cole was pleased to pass upon them, and soon afterwards sent her from the country a handsome acknowledgment. But it was not so easy to replace to our community the loss of so sweet a member of it, for not to mention her beauty, she was one of those mild, pliant creatures that if one does not entirely esteem, one can scarce help loving, which is not such a bad compensation, neither. Owing all her weaknesses to good nature, and an indolent facility that kept her too much at the mercy of first impressions, she had just sense enough to know that she wanted leading strings, and thought herself so much obliged to any who would take the pains to think for her and guide her that with a very little management she was capable of being made a most agreeable, nay, a most virtuous wife, for vice, it is probable, had never been her choice or her fate, if it had not been for occasion or example, or had she not depended less upon herself than upon her circumstances. This presumption her conduct afterwards verified, for presently meeting with a match that was ready cut and dry for her, with a neighbor's son of her own rank, and a young man of sense and order, who took her as the widow of one lost at sea, for so it seems one of her gallants, whose name she had made free with, really was. She naturally struck into all the duties of their domestic life with as much constancy and regularity as if she'd never swerved from a state of undebauched innocence from her youth. These desertions had, however, now so far thinned Mrs. Cole's brood, that she was left with only me, like a hen with one chicken. But though she was earnestly entreated and encouraged to recruit her core, her growing infirmities, and above all, the tortures of a stubborn hip-gout, which she found would yield to no remedy, determined her to bread up her business and retire with a decent pittance into the country, where I promised myself nothing so sure as my going down to live with her as soon as I had seen a little more of life, and improved my small matters into a competency that would create in me an independence on the world. For I was now, thanks to Mrs. Cole, wise enough to keep that essential in view." Thus I was then to lose my faithful preceptress, as did the philosophers of the town the white crow of her profession. For besides that she never ransacked her customers, besides that she never racked her pupils with unconscionable extortions, nor ever put their hard earnings, as she called them, under the contribution of poundage. She was a severe enemy to the seduction for innocence, and confined her acquisition solely to those unfortunate young women who, having lost it, were but the juster objects of compassion. Among these, indeed, she picked but such as suited her views, and taking them under her protection, rescued them from the danger of the public sinks of ruin and misery, to place or do for them, well or ill, in the manner you have seen. Having then settled her affairs, she set out on her journey after taking the most tender leave of me, and at the end of some excellent instructions, recommending me to myself with an anxiety perfectly maternal. In short, she affected me so much that I was not presently reconciled to myself for suffering her at any rate to go without me, but fate had, it seems, otherwise disposed of me. I had on my separation from Mrs. Cole, 
taken a pleasant, convenient house at Marybon, but easy to rent and manage from its smallness, which I furnished neatly and modestly. There, with a reserve of eight hundred pounds, the fruit of my deference to Mrs. Cole's counsels, exclusive of clothes, some jewels, some plate, I saw myself in purse for a long time to wait without impatience for what the chapter of accidents might produce in my favor. Here, under the new character of a young gentlewoman whose husband was gone to sea, I had marked me out such lines of life and conduct as leaving me at a competent liberty to pursue my views, either out of pleasure or fortune, bounded me nevertheless strictly within the rules of decency and discretion, a disposition in which you cannot escape observing a true pupil of Mrs. Cole. I was scarce, however, well warm in my new abode, when going out one morning pretty early to enjoy the freshness of it, in the pleasing outlet of the fields, accompanied only by a maid, whom I had newly hired. As we were carelessly walking among the trees, we were alarmed with the noise of a violent coughing. Turning our heads towards which, we distinguished a plain, well-dressed elderly gentleman, who, attacked with a sudden fit, was so much overcome as to be forced to give way to it and sit down at the foot of a tree, where he seemed suffocating with the severity of it, being perfectly black in the face not less moved than frightened with which I flew on the instant to his relief, and using the road of practice I had observed on the like occasion, I loosened his cravat and clapped him on the back. But whether to any purpose, or whether the cough had its own course, I know not. But the fit immediately went off, and now recovered to his speech and legs, he returned me thanks, with as much emphasis as if I had saved his life. This naturally engaging a conversation... He acquainted me where he lived, which was at a considerable distance from where I met with him, and where he had strayed insensibly on the same intention of a morning walk. He was, as I afterwards learned in the course of the intimacy which this little accident gave birth to, an old bachelor turned of sixty, but of a vigorous complexion, insomuch that he scarce marked five and forty having never racked his constitution by permitting his desires to overtax his ability. As to his birth and condition, his parents, honest and failed mechanics, had, by the best traces he could get of them, left him an infant orphan on the parish, so that it was from a charity school that, by honesty and industry, he made his way into a merchant's counting house, from whence, being sent to a house in Cadiz, he there, by his talents and activity, acquired a fortune, but an immense one, with which he returned to his native country, where he could not, however, so much as fish out one single relation out of the obscurity he was born in. Taking then a taste for retirement, and so pleased to enjoy life, like a mistress in the dark, he flowed his days in all the ease of opulence, without the least parade of it, and rather studying the concealment than the shoe of a fortune, looked down on a world he perfectly knew himself, to his wish, unknown and unmarked by. But as I propose to devote a letter entirely to the pleasure of retracing to you all the particulars of my acquaintance with this ever to me memorable friend, I shall in this transiently touch on no more than may serve as mortar to cement, to form the connection of my history, and to obviate your surprise that one of my high blood and relish of life should count a gallant of three score such a catch. Referring then to a more explicit narrative, to explain by what progressions our acquaintance, certainly innocent at first, insensibly changed nature, and ran into unplatonic length, as might well be expected from one of my condition of life, and above all, from that principle of electricity that scarce ever fails of producing fire when the sexes meet. I shall only her acquaint you that his age had not subdued his tenderness for our sex, neither had it robbed him of the power of pleasing, since whatever he wanted in the bewitching charms of youth he atoned for, or supplemented with the advantages of experience the sweetness of his manners, and above all, his flattering address in touching the heart, 
by an application to the understanding. From him it was I first learned, to any purpose, and not without infinite pleasure, that I had such a portion of me worth bestowing some regard on. From him I received my first essential encouragement, and instructions how to put it in that train of cultivation, which I have since pushed to the little degree of improvement you see it at. He it was who first taught me to be sensible, that the pleasures of the mind were superior to those of the body. At the same time that they were so far from obnoxious to or incompatible with each other, that besides the sweetness in the variety and transition, the one served to exalt and perfect the taste of the other to a degree that the senses alone could never arrive at. Himself a rational pleasurist, as being much too wise to be ashamed of the pleasures of humanity, loved me indeed, but loved me with dignity, in a mean equally removed from the sourness or forwardness by which age is unpleasingly characterized, and from that childish silly dotage that so often disgraces it, and which he himself used to turn into ridicule, and compare to an old goat affecting the frisk of a young kid. In short, everything that is generally unamiable in his season of life was, in him, repaired by so many advantages that he existed a proof, manifest at least to me, that it is not out of the power of age to please. If it lays out to please, and if, making just allowances, those in that class do not forget that it must cost them more pains and attention than what youth, the natural springtime of joy, stands in need of as fruits out of season require proportionately more skill and cultivation to force them. With this gentleman, then, who took me home soon after our acquaintance commenced, I lived near eight months, in which time my constant complaisance and docility, my attention to deserve his confidence and love, and a conduct in general, devoid of the least art and founded on my sincere regard and esteem for him, one and attached him so firmly to me that after having generously trusted me with a genteel independent settlement proceeding to heap marks of affection on me he appointed me by an authentic will his sole heiress and executrix a disposition which he did not outlive two months being taken from me by a violent cold that he contracted as he unadvisedly ran to the window on an alarm of fire at some street's distance and stood there naked-breasted and exposed to the fatal impressions of a damp night air. After acquitting myself of my duty towards my deceased benefactor, and paying him a tribute of unfeigned sorrow, which a little time changed into a most tender grateful memory of him that I shall ever retain, I grew somewhat comforted by the prospect that now opened to me, if not of happiness, at least of affluence and independence. I saw myself then in the full bloom and pride of youth, for I was not yet nineteen, actually at the head of so large a fortune, as it would have been even the height of impudence in me to have raised my wishes, much more my hopes to, and that this unexpected elevation did not turn my head, I owed to the pains my benefactor had taken to form and prepare me for it, as I owed his opinion of my management of the vast possessions he left me to what he had observed of the prudential economy I had learned under Mrs. Cole, of which the reserve he saw I had made was a proof and encouragement to him. But alas, how easily is the enjoyment of the greatest sweets in life, in present possession, poisoned by the regret of an absent one. But my regret was a mighty and just one, since it had my only truly beloved Charles for its object. Given him up I had, indeed, completely, having never once heard from him since our separation, which, as I found afterwards, had been my misfortune, and not his neglect, for he wrote me several letters, which had all miscarried, but forgotten him I never had. Amidst all my personal infidelities, not one had made a pin's point impression on a heart impenetrable to the true love passion but for him. As soon, however, I was mistress of this unexpected fortune, I felt more than ever how dear he was to me, from its insufficiency to make me happy, whilst he was not to share it with me. My earliest care, consequently, was to endeavor at getting some account of him, 
but all my researches produced me no more light than his father had been dead for some time. Not so well as even with the world. And that Charles had reached his port of destination in the South Seas, where finding the estate he was sent to recover dwindled to a trifle by the loss of two ships in which the bulk of his uncle's fortune lay, he was come away with a small reminder, and might, perhaps according to the best advice, in a few months return to England, from whence he had, at the time of this my inquiry, been absent two years and seven months, a little eternity in love. You cannot conceive with what joy I embrace the hopes thus given me of seeing the delight of my heart again. But as the terms of months was assigned it, in order to divert and amuse my impatience for his return, after settling my affairs with much ease and security, I set out on a journey for Lancashire, with an equipage suitable to my fortune, and with a design purely to revisit my place of nativity, for which I could not help retaining a great tenderness, and might naturally not be sorry to shew myself there. To the advantage I was now in past to do, after the report Esther Davis had spread of my being spirited away to the plantations, for on no other supposition could she account for the suppression of myself to her, since her leaving me so abruptly at the inn. Another favorite intention I had, to look out for my relations, though I had none besides distant ones, and prove a benefactress to them. Then Mrs. Cole's place of retirement lying in my way, was not amongst the least of the pleasures I had proposed to myself in this expedition. I had taken nobody with me but a discreet, decent woman to figure it as my companion, besides my servants, and was scarce got into an inn about twenty miles from London, where I was to sup and pass the night, when such a storm of wind and rain sprang up as made me congratulate myself on having got under shelter before it began. This had continued a good half hour, when bethinking me of some directions to be given to the coachman, I sent for him, and not caring that his shoes should soil the very clean parlour in which the cloth was laid, I stepped into the hall kitchen where he was, and where, whilst I was talking to him, I slantingly observed two horsemen driven in by the weather, and both ringing wet, one of whom was asking if they could not be assisted with a change while their clothes were dried. But heavens! Who can express what I felt at the sound of a voice ever present to my heart, and that is now rebounded at? Or when pointing my eyes towards the person it came from, they confirmed its information in spite of so long an absence and of a dress one would have imagined studied for a disguise, a horseman's great coat with a stand-up cape and his hat flapped. But what could escape the piercing alertness of a sense surely guided by love? A transport then like mine was above all consideration or schemes of surprise, and I, that instant, with the rapidity of the emotions that I felt the spur of, shot into his arms, crying out, as I threw mine round his neck, My life! My soul! My Charles! And without further power of speech, swooned away under the pressing agitations of joy and surprise. Recovered out of my entrancement, I found myself in my charmer's arms. But in the parlour, surrounded by a crowd, which this event had gathered round us, and which immediately, on a signal from the discreet landlady, who currently took him for my husband, cleared the room, and desirably left us alone to the raptures of this reunion, my joy at which had liked to have proved, at the expense of my life, power superior to that of grief at our fatal separation. The first object, then, that my eyes opened on was their supreme idol, and my supreme wish Charles on one knee, holding me fast by the hand and gazing on me with a transport of fondness. Observing my recovery, he attempted to speak and give vent to his patience of hearing my voice again, to satisfy him once more that it was me. But the mightiness and suddenness of the surprise, continuing to stun him, choked his utterance. He could only stammer out a few broken, half-formed, faltering accents, which my ears greedily drinking in spelt, and put, can it? Can it be you? Stifling me at the same time with kisses that stopping my mouth at once prevented the answer that he panted for, and increased the delicious disorder in which all my senses were rapturously lost. Amidst, however, this crowd of ideas, and all blissful ones, there obtruded only one cruel doubt, that poisoned nearly all the transcendent happiness. And what was it, 
but my dread of it being too excessive to be real. I tremble now with the fear of its being no more than a dream, and of my waking out of it into the horrors of finding it one. Under this fond apprehension, imagining I could not make too much of the present prodigious joy, before it should vanish and leave me in the desert again, nor verify its reality too strongly, I clung to him, I clasped him, as if to hinder him from escaping me again. Where have you been? How could you? Could you leave me? Say you are still mine, that you still love me, and thus, thus, kissing him as if I would consolidate lips with him. I forgive you. Forgive my hard fortune in favor of this restoration. All these interjections breaking from me in that wildness of expression that justly passes for eloquence in love, drew from him all the returns my fond heart could wish or require. Our caresses, our questions, our answers, for some time observed no order, all crossing or interrupting one another in sweet confusion, whilst we exchanged hearts at our eyes and renewed the ratifications of a love unabated by time or absence, not a breath, not a motion, not a gesture on either side, but was strongly impressed with it. Our hands, locked in each other, repeated the most passionate squeezes so that their fiery thrill went to the heart again. Thus absorbed and concentrated in this unutterable delight, I had not attended to the sweet author of it, being thoroughly wet and in danger of catching cold, when in good time the landlady, whom the appearance of my equipage, which, by the by, Charles knew nothing of, had gained me an interest in, for me and mine, interrupted us by bringing in a decent shift of linen and clothes, which now, somewhat recovered into a calmer composure, by the coming in of a third person, I pressed him to take the benefit of, with a tender concern and anxiety that made me tremble for his health. The landlady leaving us again, he proceeded to shift, in the act of which, though he proceeded with all that modesty which became the first solemner instance of our re-meeting after so long an absence, I could not contain certain snatches of my eyes, lured by the dazzling discoveries of his naked skin, that escaped him as he changed his linen, and which I could not observe the unfaded life and complexion of without emotions of tenderness and joy, that had himself too purely for their object to partake of a loose or mistimed desire. He was soon dressed in these temporary clothes, which neither fitted him now became the light my passion placed him in, to me at least, Yet as they were on him, they looked extremely well, in virtue of the magic charm which love put into everything that he touched, or had relation to him, and where indeed was that dress that a figure like this would not give grace to? For now, as I eyed him more in detail, I could not but observe the even favorable alteration which the time of his absence had produced in his person. There were still the requisite lineaments, and the same vivid vermilion and bloom reigning on his face, but now the roses were more fully blown. The tan of his travels, and a beard somewhat more distinguishable, had, at the expense of no more delicacy than what he could well spare, give it an air of becoming manliness and maturity that symmetrized nobly with that air of distinction and empire with which nature had stamped it, in a rare mixture with the sweetness of it, still nothing he lost of that smooth plumpness of flesh, which, glowing with freshness, blooms florid to the eye and delicious to the touch. Then his shoulders were grown more square, his shape more formed, more portly, but still free and airy. In short, his figure showed riper, greater, and perfecter to the experienced eye than in his tender youth, and now he was not much more than two and twenty. In this interval, however, I picked out of the broken, often pleasingly interrupted account of himself that he was at that instant actually on his road to London, in not a very paramount plight or condition, having been wrecked on the Irish coast, for which he had prematurely embarked, and lost all the little he had brought with him from the South Seas, so that he had not till after great shifts and hardships in the company of his fellow traveller, the captain, got so far on his journey, that so it was, having heard of his father's death and circumstances, he had now the world to begin again, on a new account, a situation which, he assured me, in a vein of sincerity that flowing from his heart penetrated mine, gave him to farther pain, than that he had not in his power to make me as happy as he could wish. 
My fortune, you will please to observe, I had not entered upon, or any overture of, reserving to feast myself with the surprise of it to him, in calmer instance. And, as to my dress, it could give him no idea of the truth, not only as it was mourning, but likewise in a style of plainness and simplicity that I had ever kept to with studied art. He pressed me, indeed, tenderly to satisfy his ardent curiosity, both with regard to my past and present state of life, since his being torn away from me, but I had the address to elude his questions by answers that, shewing his satisfaction at no great distance, won upon him to waive his impatience, in favor of the thorough confidence he had in my not delaying it, but for respects I should in good time acquaint him with. Charles, however, thus returned to my longing arms, tender, faithful, and in health, was already a blessing too mighty for my conception. But Charles in distress, Charles reduced and broken down to his naked personal merit, was such a circumstance in favor of the sentiments I had for him, as exceeded my utmost desires, and accordingly I seemed so visibly charmed, so out of time and measure pleased at his mention of his ruined fortune, that he could account for it no way, but that the joy of seeing him again had swallowed up every other sense or concern. In the meantime, my woman had taken all possible care of Charles's traveling companion, and as supper was coming in, he was introduced to me when I received him as became my regard for all of Charles's acquaintance or friends. We four then supped together, in the style of joy, congratulation, and pleasing disorder that you may guess. For my part, though all these agitations had left me not in the least stomach but for that uncloying feast, the sight of my adored youth, I endeavored to force it, by way of example for him, who I conjectured must want a recruit after riding, and indeed he ate like a traveller, but gazed at and addressed me all the time like a lover. After the cloth was taken away, and the hour of repose came on, Charles and I were, without further ceremony, in quality of man and wife, shewn up together to a very handsome apartment, and in all course the bed. They said, the best in the inn. And here, decency, forgive me, if once more I violate thy laws and keeping the curtains undrawn, sacrifice thee for the last time to that confidence without reserve with which I engage to recount to you the most striking circumstances of my youthful disorders. As soon then, as we were in the room together, left to ourselves, the sight of the bed starting the remembrance of our first joys, and the thought of my being instantly to share it with the dear possessor of my virgin heart, moved me so strongly that I was well leaned upon him, or must have fainted again under the overpowering sweet alarm. Charles saw into my confusion, and forgot his own, that was scarce less, to apply himself to the removal of mine. But now the true refining passion had regained through the possession of me, with all its train of symptoms, a sweet sensibility, a tender timidity, lovesick yearnings tempered with diffidence and modesty, all held me in subjection of soul, incomparably dearer to me than the liberty of heart which I had been long, too long, the mistress of, in the course of those grosser gallantries, the consciousness of which now made me sigh with a virtuous confusion and regret. No real virgin in view of the nuptial bed could give more bashful blushes to the unblemished innocence than I did to a sense of guilt, and indeed I loved Charles too truly not to feel severely that I did not deserve him. As I kept hesitating and disconcerted under this soft distraction, Charles, with a fond impatience, took the pains to undress me, and all I can remember amidst the flutter and discomposure of my senses with some flattering exclamations of joy and admiration, more especially at the feel of my breasts, now set at liberty from my stays, in which panting and rising in tumultuous throbs swelled upon his dear touch and gave it the welcome pleasure of finding them well formed and unfailed in firmness. I was soon laid in bed, and scarce languished an instant for the darling partner of it before he was undressed and got between the sheets, with his arms clasped round me, giving and taking, with gust inexpressible, a kiss of welcome, that my heart rising to my lips stamped with its warmest impression, concurring to by bliss, with that delicate and voluptuous emotion which Charles alone had the secret to excite, 
and which constitutes the very life, the essence of pleasure. Meanwhile, two candles lighted on a side table near us, and a joyous wood fire threw a light into the bed that took from one sense of great importance to our joys, all pretext for complaining of its being shut out of its share of them, and indeed, the sight of my idolized youth was alone from the ardor with which I had wished for it without other circumstance, a pleasure to die of. But his action was now a necessity to desire so much on edge as ours. Charles, after a very short preclusive dalliance, lifting up my linen and his own, laid the broad treasures of his manly chest close to my bosom, both beating with the tenderest alarms when now the sense of his glowing body, naked in touch with mine, took all power over my thoughts out of my own disposal, and delivered up every faculty of the soul to the sensiblest of joys, that affecting me infinitely more with my distinction of the person than of the sex, now brought my conscious heart deliciously into play. My heart, which eternally constant to Charles, had never taken any part in my occasional sacrifices to the calls of constitution, complaisance, or interest. But, ah, what became of me, when as the powers of solid pleasure thickened upon me, I could not help feeling the stiff stake that had been adorned with the trophies of my despoiled virginity, bearing hard and inflexible against one of my thighs, which I had not yet opened, from a true principle of modesty, revived by a passion too sincere to suffer any aiming at the false merit of difficulty, or my putting on an impertinent mock coyness. I have, I believe, somewhere before remarked that the feel of that favorite piece of manhood has, in the very nature of it, something inimitably pathetic. Nothing can be dearer to the touch, nor affect it with a more delicious sensation. Think then, as a love thinks, what must be the consummate transport of that quickest of our senses, in their central seat, too when after so long a deprival, it felt itself re-inflamed under the pressure of that peculiar scepter member which commands us all, but especially, my darling, elect from the face of the whole earth. And now, at its mightiest point of stiffness, it felt to me something so subduing, so active, so solid and agreeable, that I know not what name to give its singular impression but the sentiment of consciousness of its belonging to my supremely beloved youth gave me so pleasing an agitation and worked so strongly on my soul that it sent all its sensitive spirits to that organ of bliss in me dedicated to its reception. There, concentering to a point, like rays in a burning glass, they glowed. They burnt with the intensest heat, the springs of pleasure were in short wound up to such a pitch I panted now so exquisitely keen an appetite for the eminent enjoyment that I was even sick with desire, and unequal to support the combination of two distinct ideas that delightfully distracted me. For all the thought I was capable of was that I was now in touch at once with the instrument of pleasure and the great seal of love, ideas that, mingling streams, poured such an ocean of intoxicating bliss on a weak vessel all too narrow to contain it, that I lay overwhelmed, absorbed, lost in an abyss of joy, and dying of nothing but immoderate delight. Charles then roused me, somewhat out of this ecstatic distraction, with a complaint softly murmured amidst a crowd of kisses at the position not so favorable to his desires, in which I received his urgent insistence for admission where that insistence was alone so engrossing a pleasure that it made me inconsistently suffer a much dearer one to be kept out. But how sweet to correct such a mistake! My thighs, now obedient to the imitations of love and nature, gladly disclose, and with ready submission, rein up the soft gateway to the entrance of pleasure. I see, I feel the delicious velvet tip, he enters me might and main with, oh, my pen drops from me here in the ecstasy now present to my faithful memory. Description too deserts me and delivers over a task above its strength of wing to the imagination. But it must be an imagination exalted by such a flame as mine that can do justice to that sweetest, noblest of all sensations that hailed and accompanied the stiff insinuation all the way up till it was at the end of its penetration 
sending up through my eyes the sparks of the love fire that ran all over me and blazed in every vein and every pore of me, a system incarnate of joy all over. I had now totally taken in love's true arrow from the point up to the feather. In that part were making now a new wound, the lips of the original one of nature, which had owed its first breathing to this dear instrument, clung as if sensible of gratitude, in eager suction round it, whilst all its inwards embraced it tenderly with a warmth of gust, a compressive energy that gave it, in its way, the heartiest welcome in nature. Every fiber there gathering tight round it, and straining ambitiously to come in for its share of the blissful touch. As we were giving them a few moments of pause to the delectation of the senses, and dwelling with the highest relish on this intimate point of reunion, and chewing the cut of enjoyment, the impatience natural to the pleasure soon drove us into action. Then began the driving tumult on his side, and the responsive heaves on mine, which kept me up to him, whilst, as our joys grew too great for utterance, the organs of our voices voluptuously intermixing became organs of the touch. And oh, the touch, how delicious! That touch, how poignantly luscious! And now, now I felt to the heart of me, I felt the prodigious keen edge with which love, presiding over this act, points the pleasure love that may be styled the attic salt of enjoyment and indeed without it the joy great as it is is still a vulgar one whether a king or a beggar for it is undoubtedly love alone that refines ennobles and exalts it thus happy then by the heart happy by the senses it was beyond all power even of thought to form the conception of a greater delight than what i was now consummating the fruition of Charles, whose whole frame was convulsed with the agitation of his rapture, whilst the tenderest fires trembled in his eyes, all assured me of a perfect concord of joy, penetrated me so profoundly, touched me so vitally, took me so much out of my own possession, whilst he seemed himself so much in mine, that in a delicious enthusiasm I imagined such a transfusion of heart and spirit as that coalescing and making one body and soul with him, I was he, and he, me. But all this pleasure tending, like life from its first instance, towards its own dissolution, lived too fast not to bring on upon the spur its delicious moment of mortality. For presently the approach of the tender agony discovered itself by its usual signals, that were quickly followed by my dear love's emanation of himself that spun, hour, and shot, feelingly indeed, up the ravished indraught, where the sweetly soothing balmy titillation opened up all the juices of joy on my side, which ecstatically in flow helped to allay the prurient glow and drowned our pleasure for a while. Soon, however, to be on float again. For Charles, true to nature's laws, in one breath expiring and ejaculating, languished not long in the dissolving trance, but recovering spirit again, soon gave me to feel that the true metal springs of his instrument of pleasure were by love, and perhaps by a long vacation, wound up too high to be let down by a single explosion. His stiffness still stood, my friend, resuming then the action afresh without dislodging or giving me the trouble of parting from my sweet tenant. We played over again the same opera, with the same delightful harmony in concert. Our ardors, like our love, knew no remission, and all as the tide served my lover, lavish of his stores and pleasure milked overflowed me once more from the fullness of his oval reservoirs of the genial emulsion, whilst on my side a convulsive grasp, in the instant of my giving down the liquid contribution, rendered me sweetly subservient at once to the increase of his joy and of its effusions, moving me so as to make me exert all those springs of the compressive exuction with which the sensitive mechanism of that part thirstily draws and drains the nipple of love. With much such an instinctive eagerness and attachment as to compare great with less kind nature engages infants at the breast by the pleasure they find in the motion of their little mouths and cheeks to extract the milky stream prepared for their nourishment but there was still no end of his vigour this double discharge had so far from extinguished his desires for that time that it had not even calmed them and at his age desires are power he was proceeding then amazingly to push it to a third triumph, still without uncasing, 
if a tenderness natural to true love had not inspired me with self-denial enough to spare and not overstrain him and accordingly entreating him to give himself and me quarter i obtained at length a short suspension of arms but not before he had exultingly satisfied me that he gave me outstanding the remainder of the night with which we borrowed upon the day we employed with unwearied fervor in celebrating thus the festival of our re-meeting and got up pretty late in the morning gay brisk and alert though rest had been a stranger to us but the pleasures of love had been to us what the joy of victory is to an army repose refreshment everything The journey into the country being now entirely out of the question, and orders having been given overnight for turning the horses' heads towards London, we left the inn as soon as we had breakfasted, not without a liberal distribution of the tokens of my grateful sense of the happiness I had met with in it. Charles and I were in my coach, the captain and my companion in a chaise hired purposefully for them, to leave us the conveniency of a tete-a-tete. Here on the road, as the tumult of my senses was tolerably composed, I had command enough to head to break properly to him the course of life that the consequence of my separation from him had driven me into, which at the same time he tenderly deplored with me. He was the less shocked at, as on reflecting how he had left me circumstance, he could not be entirely unprepared for it. But when I opened the state of my fortune to him, and with that sincerity which, from me to him, was so much of a nature in me, I begged of him his acceptance of it, on his own terms. I should appear to you perhaps too partial to my passion, were I to attempt the doing of his delicacy justice. I shall content myself then with assuring you that after his flatly refusing the unreserved, unconditional donation that I long persecuted him in vain to accept, it was at length, in obedience to his serious commands, for I stood out unaffectedly, till he exerted the sovereign authority with which love had given him over me, that I yielded my consent to waive the remonstrance I did not fail of making strongly to him, against his degrading himself, and incurring the reflection, however unjust, of having, for respects of fortune, bartered his honour for infamy and prostitution, in making one his wife, who thought herself too much honoured in being but his mistress. The plea of love then overruling all objections, Charles entirely won with the merit of my sentiments for him, which he could not but read the sincerity of in a heart ever open to him, obliged me to receive his hand, by which means I was in pass, among other innumerable blessings, to bestow a legal parentage on those fine children you have seen by this happiest of matches. Thus at length I got snug into port where in the bosom of virtue I gathered the only uncorrupt sweets, where looking back on the course of vice I had run, and comparing its infamous blandishments with the infinitely superior joys of innocence, I could not help pitying, even in point of taste, those who, immersed in gross sensuality, are insensible to the so delicate charms of virtue, than which even pleasure has not a greater friend, nor than vice a greater enemy." Thus temperance makes men lords over those pleasures that intemperance enslaves them to. The one, the parent of health, vigor, fertility, cheerfulness, and every other desirable good of life, the other, of diseases, debility, barrenness, self-loathing, with only every evil incident to human nature. You laugh, perhaps, at this tailpiece of morality, extracted from me by the force of truth, resulting from compared experiences. You think it, no doubt, out of place, out of character. Possibly, too, you may look on it as the paltry finesse of one who seeks to mask a devotee to vice under a rag of a veil, impudently smuggled from the shrine of virtue, just as if one was to fancy oneself completely disguised at a masquerade, with no other change of dress than turning one's shoes into slippers, or as if a writer should think to shield a treasonable libel by concluding it with a formal prayer for the king but independent of my flattering myself that you have a juster opinion of my sense and sincerity, give me leave to represent to you that such a supposition is even more injurious to virtue than to me, since, consistently with candor and good nature, it can have no foundation but in the falsest of fears that its pleasures cannot stand in comparison with those of vice. But let truth dare to hold it up in its most alluring light. Then mark how spurious, how low of taste, 
how comparatively inferior its joys are to those which virtue gives sanction to, and whose sentiments are not above making even a sauce for the senses, but a sauce of the highest relish, whilst vices are the harpies that infect and foul the feast. The paths of vice are sometimes strewed with roses, but then they are for ever infamous for many a thorn, for many a cankerworm. Those of virtue are strewed with roses purely, and those eternally unfading ones. If you do me then justice, you will esteem me perfectly consistent in the incense I burn to virtue. If I had painted vice in all its gayest colors, if I have decked it with flowers, it has been solely in order to make the worthier, the solemner sacrifice of it to virtue. You know Mr. C. O. You know his estate, his worth, and good sense. Can you, will you pronounce it ill-meant, at least of him, when anxious for his son's morals, with a view to form him to virtue and inspire him with a fixed, a rational contempt for vice, he consented to be his master of the ceremonies and led him by the hand through the most noted body houses in town, where he took care he should be familiarized with all those scenes of debauchery so fit to nauseate a good taste. The experiment, you will cry, is dangerous. True, on a fool. But are fools worth so much attention? I shall see you soon, and in the meantime, think candidly of me, and believe me ever, Madam, yours, etc., etc., etc. End of Part 10 End of Fanny Hill Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure By John Cleland Published in 1749 Read by Nocturna In Monrovia, California Spring 2006